uh, important topic that he will be sharing, you know, uh, his thoughts uh, and in the context of Nepal and sharing his experiences also. And we have uh, Professor John Rong P on strategy of preven prevention of national interest. And so his, uh, uh, through a new constitution, actually this is uh, the, the issue of uh, a, a national interest. Uh, the subject, uh, Professor A will be uh, sharing with us. And uh, lastly, Ms. Menaka Guruswami, was studied, you know, especially the civil military relations from Harvard University, and uh, uh, and she uh, actually uh, picked up the subject, but the the, the topic was uh, given a little different, I think. But uh, I think uh, she will be sharing exactly the same. Okay, great. Civil civil military relations in the new setup. Okay, this uh, and to comment on that, and you know, actually we have equally competent uh, and very prominent group. Uh, we have a. On our side, the journalist, a prominent you know, the, uh, journalist of Nepal, Mr. Geja Sarma Wagale. Lieutenant General retired, Sadib Sa, well known to us, and he'll be sharing, you know, is, uh, providing more inputs. And we have uh, Professor Dr. Indrajit Rai, uh, and uh, we have uh, Major General Kumar Fudun. So, with this, you know, the, the panel, with this team, you know, I, we hope, you know, the, the issues that we'll be discussing will be quite uh, productive and uh, useful for uh, the, 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 the CA members and other uh, involved in the constitution making process in Nepal to, uh, to refine the constitution, uh, the draft that will be prepared and to help them really deal, address the issues, you know, involved in it. Now, with these words, uh, I would like to first, you know, request uh, our chairperson also, you know, just uh, to kindly, on the one hand, you know, issue is very important, maybe the temptation will be very high to, you know, have, uh, to speak more, but also to manage time. Managing time is also equally important because otherwise you will be doing injustice to other sessions. Uh, so now I will hand over the microphone to Honorable Sapna Mala. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We'll be again in transition. That is what we are also discussing in the consent assembly because even after new constitution will be promulgated, uh, we will not be able to operationalize the constitution on the same day of adoption because we have to create a federal structure. We have to create all the uh, constitutional bodies as per the new constitution. Uh, we have to um, uh, create the whole uh, new structure system from the head of the state to executive head to the um, to the parliament and local government uh, and I don't think any of the paper will be highlighting uh, those uh, issues but then I think um, uh, the civil military relationship is, is also uh, very much uh, linked uh, with the transition because uh, reintegration is a big issue where Monica is uh, going to give lots of input and uh, I'm hoping that commentators will be complimenting and, and giving a new um, constructive ideas uh, for, um, uh, for uh, reintegration of Nepal. Uh, second um, topic again is on the national interest. Uh, yes, we have one paper on national interest and traditionally whenever we talk about national interest, what comes in our mind is uh, sovereignty and uh, national territory. Um, uh, but today, uh, I mean, in Nepal, if you look into the present uh, socio-political uh, cultural context, um, uh, what is national interest? I think the time has come. We also need to redefine national interest, national interest uh, from the perspective of the government or from the perspective of the people, uh, especially where uh, the politics of identity is in the mainstream. And not only there is a claim of uh, individual right, but uh, collective rights, and then how to balance between different collective rights, how to bring unity in diversity, uh, and then, um, you know, so because of that, lots of uh, tension of, um, uh, tension of uh, multiple identity uh, needs to be managed. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are different pro provisions which has been proposed even in the draft, uh, not only uh, defining what is national <coughs> interest, but uh, how do we manage or uh, protect the national interest, especially also in terms of external relationship with different treaty jurisprudence, validating treaty jurisprudence, 
<coughs> and then I come to security issue. Uh, yes, uh, state has obligation to safeguard internal uh, people from internal and external threat. Uh, but um, again, uh, coming from the human rights background, um, for me, security is uh, not only um, uh, you know threat uh, from the external um, uh, side, but also within uh, uh, internal. Uh, situation, especially when the insurgency, uh, we lived in insurgency and uh, the co root cause of uh, the conflict was unbalanced development, poverty, and therefore we also have a paper on economic uh, constitutionalism, uh, which can uh, not only address the root cause of the conflict, but also link with uh, what kind of uh, socio-economic transformation a state is uh, looking for. And uh, again, like uh, we also have a uh, Manika's paper, which will be also highlighting not only on re reintegration issue, but also linking with democratization of um, um, uh, security sector. Uh, and and uh, maybe we can also uh, some of them get comments from uh, some of the commentators on how to create policing system, security uh, system uh, in upcoming uh, federal structure. And um, uh, with the with the values uh, that can really uh, have a civil um, a co civilian control over military and uh, policing, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, policing governed by rule of law. Uh, and I'll just end here and then uh, invite uh, our first uh, speaker, Professor Wang and Jamin for. Um, uh, presenting a paper on achieving economic constitutionalism through a new constitution and I will be giving 15 minutes each uh, to each uh, paper presenter now uh, for a is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm privileged to be invited to attend this conference. I'd like to thank the conference organizers to change my presentation to this session in order to enable me to catch up my 150 flight. Uh, it's my first time to Nepal. For many Chinese people, uh, Nepal is a paradise. It's a dream to come here. Uh, I was assigned to speak on this uh, topic, uh, economic uh, development and uh, constitutionalism. Uh, I guess the reason is that uh, China achieved uh, remarkable economic uh, success in the past uh, three decades. Uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, brief you uh, how the, uh, what's the rule of the constitution, the new constitution in China play in promoting economic development. Uh, according to many uh, international statistics, China has been the fastest growing major economy for the past 30 years, with an average annual GDP growth rate above 10%. Uh, the China economy is already the third largest, uh, with a GDP uh, US dollar uh, 4.6 trillion. Uh, if measured uh, based on uh, purchasing power uh, parity, China is already the second largest economy. Uh, the uh, per capita income uh, has grown as an average annual rate of more than 80% uh, over the last three decades, uh, dramatically reduced poverty. The per capita income was raised from less than uh, 100 U.S. dollar in 1978 to above uh, over 3,000 U.S. dollar and uh, 5,000 uh, PPP in 2008, according to IMF. China is the uh, third largest import country. Uh, uh, last year, China already overtook Germany as the largest exporter uh, in uh, 2009. Its share of world exports jumped to almost 10%, uh, up from uh, 3% in 1999. Uh, <clears throat> the foreign reserve is the largest uh, in the world. 
so uh, the economic development uh, uh, is really uh, very encouraging. Uh, but I want to tell you, uh, China and Nepal, we, all, we both of us experienced a long period of time political unrest, even we call political disaster. Uh, I remember uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was a college student. Uh, we also had a lot of such kind of conferences uh, to discuss uh, how China should make a new constitution. Uh, exactly the same. Uh, how to uh, promote uh, economic development, uh, how to restore social order, uh, how to uh, uh, guarantee uh, political stability, uh, social justice through uh, the new constitution making process. Uh, exactly the same, the same conferences. Uh, <clears throat> And we did it in 1982. China made a new constitution. Uh, since uh, 1998, the new constitution has been amended for four times uh, based on economic and social development. Uh, so the China story has proven that through a new constitution, a country can achieve economic development, political stability, good governance, human rights, uh, rule of law, and social justice. Uh, let me brief you, uh, you know, how the China story is. Uh, uh, first, the uh, economic system established by the new constitution in 1982. We still call it a new constitution because we uh, previously had three constitutions since 1949. Uh, the new constitution uh, established uh, a socialist economic system. Uh, Article 1 of the new constitution says China is a socialist country. Uh, the uh, social system, uh, socialist system is a basic system. Uh, uh, thus, the fundamental economic system is based on socialist ideology, concepts. Uh, constitutionally, China is a socialist country. China is not a communist country. Uh, Western media always describe China is a communist country. Actually, if you look at the constitution, it is a socialist country. The policies uh, China practices is socialist, it's not communist. Uh, <clears throat> uh, even uh, although the name of the ruling party is the Communist Party, uh, the Charter of the Communist Party does mention the ultimate goal of the party is to build communism. So the, the fundamental economic system is based on so socialist ideology, not communist. Uh, secondly, the constitution uh, uh, pre uh, pre provided uh, the uh, public ownership of the means of production uh, and also socialist uh, distribution principle. Uh, in China, uh, the uh, ownership is uh, public ownership by the whole people and a collective, uh, collective ownership by the working people. The principle of uh, distribution of social wealth uh, resources is uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his work. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but it is uh, a, a complement to the socialist public, uh, public economy. Uh, so the new constitution uh, did not permit Chinese citizens to run private companies because the, the economy uh, originally is a, a government uh, economy. Uh, even uh, didn't permit Chinese citizens to run private companies. You can see the distinction between uh, Chinese citizens and foreign citizens. For foreign citizens, the new constitution permits a foreign investment. Uh, but for Chinese uh, the domestic investment, uh, it was prohibited originally. Uh, <clears throat> accordingly, the uh, property rights uh, 
uh, on the uh, property rights, the new constitution uh, protects uh, the public property rights earned by the state, by the whole people. Uh, so th this constitution clause has not been changed. I think we will not change it. Uh, in China, land in cities is earned by the state. Uh, in, in the rural area, uh, the land is earned by collectives. Uh, also, the Constitution says uh, socialist public property is a sacred and inviolable. Uh, as for private ownership, uh, Article 13 only says uh, the right of citizens to earn um, lawfully earned income, savings, houses, and other lawful property. Is, uh, another important uh, uh, content of the new constitution is the constitution uh, does provide uh, a lot of economic freedoms and rights for citizens. Uh, for example, uh, according to the new constitution, all citizens are equal before the law. Uh, citizens enjoy the freedom of the person, um, the personal dignity, a uh, home of citizens is inviolable, the freedom and the privacy of correspondence of citizens uh, pro uh, protected. Uh, citizens have the right as well as the duty to work. Uh, also, the citizens enjoy the freedom to engage in uh, scientific research, you know, academic freedom. Uh, of course, the Constitution says it is a duty for the citizens to pay taxes. Uh, so that's the original uh, economic system provided by the new constitution. As I said, since uh, then, the Chinese constitution has amended four times. Uh, I will tell you, you know, how the original constitutional economic system has been changed by the constitutional amendments. The uh, first constitutional amendment in China is about economic development. Uh, the, the first uh, constitutional amendment uh, uh, opens uh, a door for citizens to run economy, to run company. As I said, uh, uh, the original uh, test uh, prohibited Chinese citizens to run company, to earn company. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, many in coastal provinces, the private economy already developed very fast uh, after the new constitution was introduced. But uh, constitutionally, it was uh, 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 prohibited. So it was even a crime if you earn and run a company before 1988. Uh, I know some uh, int uh, entrepreneurs uh, was, uh, were put into jail just because you know, they earn uh, a company. Uh, so this is a very uh, important constitutional amendment. In 1993, China made, uh, for the second time, made constitutional amendments. Uh, uh, since, uh, okay, uh, the, the, uh, China invented a, a theory, that why China permits, as a socialist country, China permits the existence of private economy. The theory is, China is at the primary stage of socialism, primary stage. Uh, so that's why uh, you know, we permit a private economy. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, there is another important change is uh, China changed planning the economy to market economy. We call socialist market economy. So even many countries don't recognize uh, China's market economy status today, but constitutionally, we changed uh, in 1993. It's uh, the uh, diverse ownership. You know, in addition to public ownership, the constitution began to provide, to protect, you know, pro private uh, ownership. Uh, in 2004, for the first time, the, the China, uh, Ch Chinese people changed its constitution. Uh, there are many fundamental changes. Uh, for example, uh, in, in the past, we see China's uh, development model is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now we change. It's a Chinese-style socialism. We don't see 
Chinese uh, socialism with Chinese char characteristics any longer. We call Chinese style socialism. Uh, private property is inviolable. It's very controversial, but China introduced. Uh, you know, China protects uh, the private property rights. Uh, also introduced human rights protection. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, from the China experience, China story, uh, we can see uh, the constitutional uh, and economic reforms should be coordinated in a gradual and orderly uh, manner. It took many years for China to recognize and accept the concepts of a private economy, market economy, property, private property rights, human rights, and a rule of law. Uh, we do not need to make a perfect constitutional document before we exercise constitutionalism. Uh, secondly, the constitution uh, should be based on the history and the actual situation of the particular country. Uh, uh, one country can draw experience from other countries, but it is impossible to completely transplant a constitutional system from a foreign country. Uh, thirdly, to achieve national modernization, uh, experience has have shown democracy alone is insufficient. Is insufficient. There must be constitutionalism and the rule of law. Uh, first, the past and the current financial crisis proved that uh, free market economy is not uh, omnipotent. Uh, and the government involvement and the redistribution of resources and the social wealth are not always terrible ideas. Earlier constitutions in Western countries established a complete free market eco economic system, which were very uh, uh, suspicious and hostile toward uh, government involvement. Given the Therefore, a 21st century constitution should give the government reasonable powers to regulate the market economy and uh, allocate uh, crucial resources. This has nothing to do with ideology. It is a matter of sense. As Daniel uh, Webster once said, one country, one constitution, one destiny. To a great extent, the nature of a, uh, a country's constitution determines the destiny of the country. I'm sure the Nepalese people have the wisdom to make an excellent constitution for the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Wang Jinming, uh, for your excellent uh, contribution. You have uh, so much um, shared your experience, especially uh, very much important in our context uh, where uh, economic development is so much uh, important in the country and uh, you have shared your economic vision through the Constitution where time and again Constitution was amended for uh, distribution of benefits. I will open a next uh, presenter, um, Professor Jing Rung uh, Ye. Uh, he will be sharing his paper on strategies of preservation of national interest through a new Constitution. timing uh, conference. Um, I was given a, a, a topic about uh, national interest, particularly as uh, tailored to the process of uh, constitutional constitution making in Nepal. Um, I would like to address this issue by, uh, 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 by reference to uh, Taiwan's experience and also my uh, very limited knowledge about Nepal but also primarily as a constitutional law professor, uh, my view about constitutionalism, particularly in transitional context. Um, let me begin by uh, sort of lay out three questions in front of us when it comes to national interest and uh, constitution making. How are we going to embody those national interests in the constitution making? Again, in the text or in the process. So let's begin by identifying national interest before we link to 
constitutional making. National interest could be everything. I mean, it's impossible to say that any national policy making would forget national interest. When it comes to trade negotiation, when it comes to treaty making, when it comes to health policy, when it comes to anything, especially in this globalized era, it's almost impossible to forget the element of national interest. What kind of national interests are in order that deserve our attention? There may be remote national interests. The current politics are not in a position to recognize them. But in the end, those are very, very important for the governance of Nepal. Some of the so-called remote interests may be even more critical than the short-term games that we perceive right now. Some of the present issue has happened nowadays in the border, in the national policy making, in everywhere, may be perceived as a serious problem. But are those the initial interests that we, we are talking about, we are empowered or we are obliged to talk about in the great moment of constitutional making? How are we going to reflect to that reality and also long-term capacity building? So the first is about national interest. Very briefly, I would try to identify a certain layers of national interest for Nepal. Number one is the survival and also the continuation of Nepal as a great nation. We are not going to see Nepal falling apart for any internal or, inter or international reason. So holding the nation together, preventing it from falling apart, is of course a very important natural interest. Despite those multiple diversity, even some of those you know, resulting in conflicts, but how to hold Nepal as a nation, preventing it from falling apart, it's very, very important natural interest to me. Secondly, when it comes to international relationship, diplomacy, how to preserve national sovereignty, how to preserve the integrity of sovereignty, and then may transcend into national policy making. That is also very, very important to me. I consider those as a second level of the national interest. Then are we going to make good policy regarding to our economical, social, ecological you know, interest? Are we making a good allocation of resources to different regions, to different groups? In my opinion, these are also very good, very important national interests. And I believe these identified national interests all are very critical in the process of constitutional making. So let's move to the second question, the reverence of national interest to in the process of constitutional making. Now we, we can begin by asking the function of constitutional change. Nepal is in the process of a holistic constitutional making, constitutional change, so they can provide a sound infrastructure, institutional infrastructure for future governance. In the past uh, research, I identified various functions of transitional constitutionalism, which is very different from classical constitutionalism. When it comes to classical constitutionalism, it's developed from Magna Carta, and lots of French Revolution and the American Revolution, we always see constitution as a way to limit the government. So called check and balance, preservation of human rights, so that government is not going to abuse their power. But in the moment of transition, social order are wanting. You know, while you are pushing forward constitutional reform, you actually are in the process of setting agenda for political reform. How are we going to reform our, say, 
local central relationship. How are we going to deal with the allocation of resources? How are we going to protect our citizens' rights and also social security? So this is the agenda setting for reform. Number two, it serves as a function to social integration. Because we people came together to talk about something which is so critical to the future of Nepal. So con uh, transitional constitutionalism has moved beyond the traditional limiting function of classical constitutionalism. So we have very reason to expect there are more function going on during this constitutional making. So we need to see national interest not only in the final text of the constitution, but also in the process of constitutional making. If we are doing the constitutional making in the very bad process, then the national interest is jeopardized, in my opinion. The function of transitional constitution may not be well served because of the bad design or bad process. So it is the combination of good process and good constitutional engineering that will perform the function of trans transitional constitutionalism. This is a very important spirit happening right now. Long-term interests need to be recognized across party line, across region. So it's not a competition, it's not a political competition. It is a engineering by, I would say, everybody are founding fathers of this constitution. With that, I, I think national interest could be advanced. Secondly, the whole, whole, the whole uh, nature, uh, a vehicle of constitutional making in preserving national interest is to build up institutional capacity for future. We may be busy with dealing with heavy issues, federalism, structure of the government, and we derive racial interest from that. I don't have enough time to, to tell it to each issue. But in general, I would say, cap institutional capacity building is the most important agenda for preserving national interest for Nepal. Now, the issues of today, terrorism, emergency, climate change, those of issues are so-called new issues. To what extent this most recent constitution can respond one way or the other to those cutting edge issues? These are the third elements that I'm going to talk about. Uh, then the, the, the last element, the embodiment of the national interest. And I think there are also some layers of consideration. The first, the first layer is what we call still institutional capacity building. How can we build one nation, one constitution, and one people? When we say one people, we see lots of multiple diversity here in Nepal, as we recognize. I was told by, by some of my friends that there are 16 New Year's in Nepal. And I was so surprised. That reflects somehow to the diversity of the society here. How can we build up a nation with only one people, regardless of your belief, regardless of your religion, regardless of your, your regional identification, but through constitutional making, through provisions, through full suffrage, through equality, through inclusiveness, we see Nepal as one nation, one people, with one constitution that we are working on. For some institutional mechanism, like equality concern, I think the other you know, group has been taking this issue very seriously. For suffrage, that, that everybody believe that they are part of the part of the nation, part of the enterprise, part of the, part of the program. So with that kind of belonging, sense of belonging, we need some provisions. And I guess 
there is no time to identify one by one. But the general concept is that full suffrage, equality, so that everybody believes that they are under the protection of human rights. But I grew up in a dictatorship, ruled by strong person, strong man. Military is everything. And now I'm a constitutional law professor in major university teaching constitutional law. And Taiwan is a vibrant constitutional democracy with very strong constitutional court, very strong civil society, growing civil society, despite lots of problems. But still, I see lots of difference. One of the major achievements during democratization is the nationalization of the military. The military in Taiwan used to be part of the KMT, because in China, when nationalists were still in China, it was KMT, Nationalist Party, from the military, a school and the military. And then when it moved to Taiwan, and Taiwan become democratized, how to contain military? So that military will loyal to the state, not to a, a given political faction. It's very, very important. And in Taiwan, we people consider it as the biggest achievements. So institutional capacity building in that way, in my opinion, is very important. And also, government structure design should be workable. Not very idealistic, but workable. So that they can deliver something to the people. So with this kind of rule of law and also respect market function and also also respect science and technology to empower Nepal for economic development. I think these are all very important capacity building. Then lastly, I think it's very important to empower civil society and, re and recognize the importance of judiciary. I have no doubt that a very functional judiciary in a constitutional democracy is so important based on our experience uh, political factor, uh, political forces that always compete. And how I should share with you, our constitutional court did a very good job in not only resolving political conflicts, but sort of, uh, sort of set an agenda for discussion. Normally we read into the, the rationale of constitutional, constitutional uh, adjudication and we found out some of the very important issue for social digestion. Politicians, they, they observe some of the articulation and rationale in constitutional adjudication. So they serve as a very important function for the development of constitutional culture. So judiciary, independent judiciary, and also the empowerment of civil society is the long-term capacity building for Nepal. Lastly, let me share with you some of my thought for this, very briefly. I think there are two ways to see this constitutional banking mechanism. One is very protective one, sort of negative. To see whether this country will fall apart, whether they will, everybody would try to seek political reins like that. But the other way is to see it positively. Nepal is in the golden opportunity to come up with good governance. In Taiwan, we have been undergoing seven rounds of piecemeal constitutional reform. Taiwanese people do not has not have any chance to come up with a grand or holistic constitutional reform. Lastly, we are in the midst of constitutional making. The efforts should be taken to think about post-constitutional making institutional bedding through legislation, through consensus building, through other, me other means. Because it's very possible that by the end of the day, we come up with a constitution. Despite it's imperfect, but we need to move on. And that kind of institutional building is also very important. With that, again, I thank for your uh, patience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.
uh, Jean Rong for your excellent uh, presentation. You have uh, very clearly mentioned that uh, it's not enough that we protect a national interest in the text of the Constitution, but we need to identify the national interest in the process of Constitution making and ensure it within the constitutional framework and even the national interest can vary depending on the social, political, uh, economic context of the country. Now uh, we have a last uh, paper presenter, uh, Ms. Menika Gurushwami, uh, who will be presenting paper on integration of combatant and uh, democratization of army. I'm very happy to have a woman presenter, especially in Nepal, where 40% uh, of combatants were women, and if you look into the peace building process, we are very proud that we are 33% women in the assembly, but we have to look for women in the peace building process, especially in the negotiation, in um, political negotiation. Uh, there is no woman at all, and you know that uh, women face different implication in the insurgency. Um, but there is no gender sensi sensitivity in the whole um, conflict transformation process, and I hope you will be touching up that issue as well in your presentation. Thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. You're obviously brave, disciplined people. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, the topic of my paper is integration of combatants, democratization of the army, and new constitutionalism in Nepal. Uh, kind of low-key, non-controversial, non-topical topic. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, <clears throat> Nepal's 12-year civil war between the Maoist People's Liberation Army and the state represented in battle by the Royal Nepal Army arrived at a precarious peace culminating in popular elections in 2008. The People's Liberation Army, the PLA, has been described as one of the largest non-state military formations in the world. At present, the PLA is estimated to have a little over 19,600 elig uh, members eligible for possible or potential integration, rehabilitation, and so on. These members, in turn, have been organized into divisions, brigades, and battalions, much like any other standing army. Given the violent conflict that ravaged the country, the issue of integration of armed combatants has become critical in Nepal. The tenuous nature of the peace between former combatants was in evidence when as recently as in mid-2009, Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal of the Maoist Party dismissed the Chief of Army Staff over alleged insubordination. This dismissal was reversed by the President, leading to the Prime Minister resigning and other parties in turn forming a new coalition government. There has been serious formal commitment expressed in various instruments and representations for the integration of eligible armed combatants. <coughs> Yet the process has run into serious trouble, both in terms of disagreement with the principle of integration and dispute over the scale and nature of integration. The issue of reconfiguration or democratization of the Royal Nepal Army into one representative of a multi-ethnic people's democracy has also posed serious challenges. In the next 15 minutes, um, I will look at in some detail the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the Interim Constitution of 2007, draft provisions of the Committee for the Protection of National Interest, and, the most recent, uh, and most recently the Prime Minister's Action Plan on Integration, as they all relate to the theme. Um, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed between the then Government of Nepal and the CPN Maoists on November 21st, 2006. It was meant to encapsulate the agreement between the Maoists, the Nepal government, and seven major political parties. Through meetings, agreements, mutually agreed to codes of conduct, representations to the United Nations, etc. The CPA is categorical that the democratic restructuring of the army, along with free and fair elections to the Constituent Assembly, were most significant commitments. And it has many provisions which relate to a managed peace process, including some of these. Maoist army combatants were to remain within specific cantonments. The United Nations was expected to verify and monitor these cantonments. And after placing Maoist con combatants within cantonments, all arms and ammunition, except those required for providing security, were to be securely stored, and keys to the single lock was to remain with the site concerned. 
the army has similar provisions that apply to them on a proportionate basis. The government of Nepal was to make all necessary arrangements for those in these cantonments. And importantly, the Interim Council of Ministers was to form a, spe a special committee to inspect, integrate and rehabilitate <coughs> Maoist combatants. The Interim Council of Ministers was also expected under the Comprehensive Peace Agreement to prepare and implement a detailed plan of action to democratize the Nepali army by taking suggestions. This included tasks such as determining the right number of the Nepali army, preparing a democratic structure reflecting national and inclusive character, and training them as per democratic principles and values of human rights. The CPA called for termination of all military action and armed mobilization and expected both sides to make a commitment from refraining from carrying out any combative activity. But in doing so, they were supposed to respect the norms and sentiments of the Janandolan and the Peace Accord. Now very briefly moving on then to the interim constitution, which also has very specific pro uh, provisions on the army and this process of peace. The interim constitution, some of you might know, came into force in January 2007. An agreement to have a constituent assembly and a new constitution was one of the results of the Janandolan Part 2 in 2006. In principle, constituent assemblies, as we know, can ignore the provisions of an interim constitution. However, we see in reality that constitution-making processes elsewhere have shown that interim provisions are often reflected in final versions. It's also interesting to note that interim constitutions are much more instruments of compromise whereas final constitutions which come into being post-elections might well reflect the philosophy of the victorious party. Now very specifically on this theme, part 20 of the interim constitution has a section called provisions regarding the army. Article 144 provides for an institution of the Nepal army and provides that the council of ministers shall appoint the commander in chief of the army. The interim constitution also provides that the council of ministers shall control and manage the Nepal army significantly with the consent of all political parties and by seeking the advice of the concerned committee of the legislature formulate an extensive plan for the democratization of the Nepal army and to implement this plan. Another provision provides that the determination of the appropriate number of the Nepal army, its democratic structure and national inclusive character shall also be determined uh, within this process. Finally, the interim constitution deals with the establishment of a national defense council comprising the prime minister and other ministers. It's important because it's on the basis of the recommendations of this council of ministers that this council uh, will then uh, determine operation and use of the Nepal army. So really setting up an objective civilian control mechanism of control over what was formerly a royal Nepal army. Finally, the, there is, finally, the committee for the protection of national interest uh, an issue which was dealt with by one of the panelists, is one of the ten thematic committees of the Constituent Assembly which specifically deals with the issue of army and integration and so on and so forth. Um, some of the themes that this committee deals with is national security, duties of the Nepal army, and the identification and definition of national interests. Under the rules of the Constituent Assembly, each, each one of the ten thematic committees is expected to prepare a preliminary draft. On May 25, 2009, the Committee for Preserving the National Interest was the first among the ten thematic committees to present a draft. The concept paper which the thematic committee in turn released called for the institution of Nepal's army to safeguard sovereignty and integrity, understandably so. The constitution of the Nepal army with a national character was to be in accordance with proportional, inclusive and democratic principles with the objective of ensuring sustainable peace, political stability and economic prosperity. Importantly, their concept paper talks about rehabilitation, management and integration of combatants living in cantonments of the PLA and the Nepal Army on the basis of the 12-point agreement and the comprehensive peace agreement. The concept paper also provides sorry, that the head of state should be the supreme commander of the Nepal Army and such, uh, and such commander shall be appointed by the Council of Ministers. Finally, the concept paper seeks to ensure accountability of Nepal's national army, paramilitary force, intelligence agencies and political organizations. But I would like to deal with some commentary by local journalists on this issue of integration because I, I believe it gives us insights. Now it has been observed that the Maoists are stronger than many other parties put together. They have 240 members in the house, a substantial mass base, 
the PLA and the Young Communist League, uh, a party organization capable of reconciling internal differences, penetrating social spheres, a lot of money and multiple front organizations. These are all local reporters. Um, in terms of integration and rehabilitation, writers observe that the problem is one of timing and nature. Some, some writers have commented that non-Maoists might insist that the question of the PLA should be settled before the constitution is written so as to level uh, the playing field. In the formula of its resolution, not only do the spectrum of Nepali political parties, the Maoists, the president and the army play key roles, but a small role might be played by a small neighbor, India. And the Indian state, as is evidenced by statements by its army chief and also its recent honoring of the present Nepali army chief, seem to be well in support of the Nepali army. It is clear that the government and the military establishment in India are committed to the Nepali army and are not thrilled about any reconfiguring of the army or quote-unquote infusion of democratic values. Stephen Cohen, a writer on military organization, says that military organizations are deeply conservative and need to re-examine their assumptions and systems on a periodical basis while retaining the historical narratives that do bind officers and soldiers together and strengthen their fighting spirit. He, however, he, however questions the uncritical acceptance of the past and an unwillingness to examine present practices. Now, most recently, the Prime Minister of Nepal came up with an action plan whereby he would like integration done in the next integration and rehabilitation done in the next 112 days. Integration could include integration to the Nepali Army, the Armed Police Force, Nepal Police, and the National Investigative Department. And the 19,602 <coughs> PLA members could have three choices of joining the political process, of being integrated, or being rehabilitated. Their choices would be based on interviews done by the Special Committee on Supervision, Integration, and Rehabilitation. And those who want rehabilitation get educational training and so on. Now, the issue of integration and security is especially critical in countries that arrive at peace and democracy after intra-nation conflict or internal strife. This is a situation that is quite different from freedom from colonizers in that the issue of integration of sections of citizens who challenge a certain status quo through a violent struggle must be carefully thought through in a manner that is sensitive to inclusion while being committed to stability. In the case of Nepal, a detailed pre-interim constitutional framework culminating in provisions within a progressive interim constitution provide guidance for such integration. Now, it's been well said to conclude that constitutionalism cannot be equated with a constitution. Louis Henkin postulates a seven-point template for contemporary constitutionalism. The institutions to monitor and ensure respect for a constitutional framework and the right of people to de determine their political affiliation. Constitution making we know is a contested terrain. Nepal's interim constitution marked a definite shift from the erstwhile monarchy. The interim constitution committed the, the nation to all the above discussed ideals.